I'm so sorry. I have been on mute. <laughs> and I just had someone uh, help point that out to me. So my apologies. Um, my name is Tracy. I'm an educator at the Natural History Museum of Utah. And uh, thank you for joining me today for Research Quest Live. Um, today we are working on our last investigation. Uh, if this is your first time in class, I'm going to be joining you or <laughs> Um, I'm going to be taking you on a step-by-step -step process of what we're working on today. Okay. Research Quest Live is a program designed for middle school students. It will help us think critically. And uh, we have class today and tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. again. Also, each day, we have the opportunity to speak with a scientist or a special guest. Today at 11 a.m., we are going to be chatting with Dr. Tim Graham. He is so cool. Um, he does science research in the desert on one of the coolest living things that you can find in the desert. Um, so I'm really excited to chat with him. So hopefully you join us at 11. All right, so class will be from 9.30 to 10.30 today. Let me go ahead and share with you my computer so that way we can get logged in together. Okay, so here you can see we have the live stream box. Okay, the live stream box um, is where you see my video. You can stop my video. You can pause it if you need to. You need to take a break. You can adjust the volume. You can make it full screen. Also here in the live stream viewer, we have the research assistant notebook that we're gonna be working on today. Let me just highlight that so you can see that line right there. I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. And right here we have submit a question using the button below. Okay, so here's the ask a question button. Uh, the last link right here says share your findings and receive a certificate or have feedback. So if you have any suggestions or feedback on the program, we'd love to hear from you. Also, when we complete class today, you can go ahead and go to this link and we will send you a certificate of completion for today's class. All right. I would love to know who is joining us today. So if you could please go ahead and submit, ask a question, just tell me your name and where you live. And I would love to hear from you. I would like to know what is your favorite desert plant? Okay, maybe you have a favorite desert plant. We're gonna be talking about the desert today with our guest speaker. I'm gonna put in here a plant that I think is so beautiful and maybe you don't know very many desert plants and that's fine too. So you can include any plant that's your favorite, but um, it's called four wing shade scale. It's really beautiful. It's one of my favorites. I'm gonna go ahead and click submit, send that off. We wanna hear from you. All right, that's it on the viewer. Okay, so let's go ahead and get logged in and we're gonna enter RQ live, L-I-V-E. Go ahead and click submit. All right, so today we are working on change in the Uinta Mountains, normal or not. I'm gonna go ahead and select get started. And we're gonna scroll down here to what is the future of a forest under attack? Like I said, this is our last investigation in the change in the Uinta Mountains, normal or not. It's our last investigation. We're gonna start it today and we will finish tomorrow. Okay, so we're gonna make as much progress as we can today um, and then probably there'll be a little bit of time for you to work on your own if you need more time. All right, so what is the future of this montane forest? Today, we're going to investigate a phenomenon that has been taking place in the Uinta Mountains of Utah. Like our scientists, you'll use your critical thinking skills to gather information about the phenomenon, analyze your data and interpret your analysis so you can communicate your findings with your peers. We're gonna click on the gather step to get started. Today we'll probably be working on the gather step and analyze step, okay? Tomorrow we'll pick up where we left off. So I'm gonna go ahead and select gather, steps one through five. And it, remember, we have our research assistant notebook over here. I'm gonna go ahead and put my name on that. Now, the research assistant notebook, when you see it here in your internet browser, 
Um, you can type right into it if you want, um, but it will not save your work. So uh, you might download it here or print it, okay? Um, if you do type right into your work uh, here, that's just fine. Um, but remember, you might not be able to save that work or maybe you just wanna take notes on a different piece of paper. That's totally fine too. All right, but I'm gonna scroll down. So on our research assistant notebook, it says section one, gather. And you can see it says your task, use models to visualize and test. So it has the instructions here. And then on the left side of your research assistant notebook, it says what step, okay? So it says steps one, two, three. All right, so we over here, we're on step one. So I just wanted to make a note of that because we want to be listening for the word food web so that way we can add a definition in our own words here. All right, so we are starting by watching this video. Hopefully my video plays well for you. If for some reason it's choppy or the sound is not great, um, you can always pause my live stream video, watch the video on your own on your screen. Okay, so that's always an option. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and make this full screen so we can watch it together. Let me make sure that my sound is on. Hi, my name is Isabel Prez Vega from the Natural History Museum of Utah, and this is my neighborhood. It's where I get the food I need, where I sleep in my safe, warm house, and where I spend time with my friends and neighbors. Everything I need to, well, survive is in my neighborhood. But what would I do if my neighborhood ran out of food or the temperature in my house was always way too warm? Would I stay? Could I survive? Could you? This is a forest of the Uenta Mountains in northeastern Utah. Like my neighborhood, this place gives its residents the things they need. Food, shelter, and a comfortable range of temperatures and precipitation. When things like the food supply and the climate are stable, the plant and animal populations here stay roughly the same. But scientists who study this region are seeing changes. The system is not stable. Average yearly temperatures are rising and the type of precipitation is changing. There are other changes too. The mountain pine beetle population has exploded and lodgepole pine trees are dying at a faster rate than ever before. With all this instability and change, what will happen to the plants and animals that live in this forest? Can they survive here? Today, we're gonna explore this question. It is an important one. Until now, this ecosystem has been a source of vital oxygen, clean water, jobs, recreation, and habitats for many species, including people. If it changes, it might not perform these functions anymore. To help us start our investigation, I want to check in with our ecosystem expert, Dr. Mitch Power. To see how changes affect populations, we first have to understand how all the species are connected. What is producing food and energy? And who are the producers and consumers that keep the ecosystem humming? The way I like to tackle this problem is to create a model based on the species present and the energy demands they have. We classify plants and animals by their trophic levels, the places each species fits in the food chain. This will help you see where each species contributes and consumes energy in the system. Okay, we have our first step. After this video, drop the plants and animals into their trophic levels to create an accurate model of the ecosystem. When you're done, we'll meet back up and take the next step in our investigation. Excellent. Okay. That video is just, I think it's so cool. Um, and hopefully you caught a few of the things that uh, Isabel was talking about. I think the great, it was a great comparison when she showed us, you know, in her home environment and neighborhood, she has everything that she needs to survive. And so that's also what we're thinking about when we think about other places where living things uh, live and uh, what they need to survive. And let's go ahead and go to the next step. 
All right, so I'm going to go ahead and click next. And then how about in our research assistant notebook, let's just quickly add a description of food web. Okay, so remember in the video, uh, he was talking about creating a model and the model shows us what eats what and where they get their energy from. So go ahead and take a moment in your own words, write what you, how you would describe a food web. All right, so on step two, we are working here on build an energy pyramid. So drag and drop populations of organisms from the food web into the energy pyramid. Okay, so we know this energy pyramid is, is uh, not the exact same thing as a food web, but it's similar, right? Um, so the living things, where do they get their energy from? So let's go ahead and click on explain the model because I think this is really helpful. Energy pyramids. There are many ways to model ecosystems. You've likely seen a few different ways of modeling who is in an ecosystem. If you completed previous research quest investigations, you may have worked with an interaction web, a food web, and a trophic level model. Each of those models is useful for different purposes. Okay, so food webs show us who is eating who in an ecosystem. Interaction webs show who is eating who, but also how organisms are related in other ways, such as competition um, or symbiotic relationships. So you may recall from a previous investigation, we uh, saw in the, in the interaction web that pine grass competes with lodgepole pines, for example. All right, trophic energy models. Now, these models help us to visualize how energy is flowing in an ecosystem. Okay, so with the trophic energy models, you might, might uh, remember what, that we have where we saw the decomposers, for example, um, and how the energy was cycling in the system. All right, now, so the model we're working with here is called an energy pyramid. It's similar to the trophic level model we have used in a previous investigation. But energy pyramids are a good way to visualize the organization of an ecosystem so that we can better see the effects of change on populations of organisms in the ecosystem. Okay, again, energy pyramids model who is there and how much energy they are contributing to the ecosystem. Okay, so it's who is there and how much energy they are contributing. So I know in my research assistant notebook, it actually asks for what, in your own words, a definition of energy model. And then you can see here, we also have producers, consumers, and decomposers. Okay, so we want to make sure we understand all of the vocabulary on this page, which there's quite a bit of it. All right, so um, you can go ahead and fill this out on your own. Uh, as we work, but let me go ahead and demonstrate for you how we're using the model. So when you have, here's the, this model over here. When I click on a living thing, so here I have Rocky Mountain Elk. It tells me what the Rocky Mountain Elk's diet is, which says grass, flowering plants, twigs, bark, pine needles, lichen. All right, now I know based on this description that Rocky Mountain Elk, it looks like they eat plants. Okay, it's a plant eater. Uh, does not eat meat. So I'm gonna go ahead and place this. I'm gonna drag and drop it to primary consumers. Now I can click on the little info circle here, the little I um, for the definition to remind me if you, if you don't remember. But uh, primary consumers, it says consumers. These consumers are organisms that consume other organisms. Specifically, they eat plants. <laughs> All right, so. I'm going to say, I want you to go ahead and be working on creating this energy pyramid. And then we'll, of course, look at it together and talk about what we notice. Um, 
but you're gonna select the organisms from over here, drag and drop them over here. Now, if you drag and drop and it goes back, that's just telling me that that's not the right category. So maybe double check your work, okay? So read the description again, be thinking about, okay, where does this one really go? Well, does it go here? No, okay, it, this uh, ground beetle, the diet is caterpillars, aphids, slugs, earthworm. Okay, so I know aphids, aphids eat plants and ground beetles eat aphids. So that's gonna put them in the secondary consumers. All right, I'm gonna give you a little bit of time to work and go ahead and build out your energy pyramid and then we'll talk about it. And don't forget to work on the definitions here in your research assistant notebook. All right, I'll check in in just a little bit.
All right. I bet you've been noticing lots of interesting things in the models. You've been working on it. Um, if you are noticing some interesting things, I would love to hear about it. Um, go ahead and submit that on the ask a question button. And uh, I'd love to hear some of the things that you have noticed that surprised you or that you're curious about as you've been putting that model together. And I'm going to give you just a little bit more time to work on your model. All right, let's go ahead and look at this model together. All right, I noticed a lot of things. <laughs> really surprised me. Okay, um, so as I was moving some of the organisms over here, um, you know, I moved over the lodgepole pines, which it says it's 50% of the biomass of the producers, which is just so interesting. So this is a lot of the energy in the system, right? So we can see that's making up a huge percentage. Um, I was a little surprised that the mountain pine beetle I imagined would be bigger. So it's about 15%. And then we have something like the American three-toed woodpecker who feeds off of the mountain pine beetles, right? Makes up 10%. All right, so um, I noticed too that here we have, so we have some pretty big players in the producers, which the lodgepole pines make up. But then as we look at the other levels, there are, there's a greater diversity of organisms and each one creates up a smaller percentage of the system. So that's something I noticed. And then when we get to the secondary consumers, again, we still have quite a bit of diversity. And again, each one makes up an even smaller percentage of the system. And then up here in tertiary, I noticed that we have three. And so they're pretty um, significant. I guess you could say there's, they make up a significant percentage, um, but Cooper's hawk is the largest percentage. That's something that I noticed that I thought was interesting. Um, so we have black bears and cougars making up 25%. All right, so let's go ahead and select next. And we're going to continue to be thinking about this energy system and some of these other factors. So it says in this video, we're going to learn about biotic and abiotic factors. And we're going to be thinking about how changes to these factors can affect populations of organisms. All right, let's go ahead and watch it together. You've organized the plants and animals by their trophic levels. Now we're going to put your ecosystem model to the test by throwing some changes at it. But which ones? More predators? Hotter summers? There's so many to choose from. Let's check in with Dr. Mitch to learn how scientists think about all the possible changes that could affect an ecosystem. Scientists typically break down all the possible changes into two categories. 
There are the changes to populations of organisms, like plants, animals, and decomposers. These all have something in common. They're all alive. So they're called biotic factors. Bio, like biology? Right. Bio means life. The other category of factors includes things like rivers, mountains, temperatures, the annual rain or snowfall. Which are not alive. Right. So they are abiotic factors. Abiotic meaning without life. Biotic, abiotic. Yes. So let's experiment with changing biotic and abiotic factors. See what you can learn from testing your model. Okay, let's put our models to the test. After this video, change biotic and abiotic factors in your model. Your population of plants and animals will change. As you see these changes, think about why they are occurring. Why would some populations shrink and others grow or stay the same? When you're done, we'll go over what you observed. Okay, excellent. So we have some new definitions, biotic and abiotic. Why don't we go ahead and just take a second, add that into our research assistant notebook. And you probably recall it said abiotic. We can just use this definition here. Abiotic factors are non-living parts of an ecosystem that shape the environment. And they named some uh, examples in the video, such as water, sunlight, atmosphere, soil, earthquakes, storms. Then we have biotic. Biotic factors are any living parts of an ecosystem, parts that influence other organisms or shape the ecosystem it lives in. Okay, so let's go ahead and add that here. Great, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and select next. Now we get to test our model. So just like we saw in the video, we're gonna experiment with changing biotic and abiotic factors by selecting from a list of common changes that occur in ecosystems. Then we'll examine the changes in your energy pyramid model and population chart to see what happens. I'm guessing we're gonna notice changes in populations um, while I'm other populations may not change. So we're gonna look for patterns. One more thing before you get started. Remember, ecosystems are complex. <laughs> we can't stress that enough. So there could be many other consequences beyond what we see here. Now, this model simulation is designed to show you how um, we have estimated or made some predictions. But of course, there's, there's other information that we may not know that may not be accurately represented in these models. So you always wanna be mindful of that. I'm gonna go ahead and select next. Oh, I, there we go. Okay, continue. So step four, what happens when change occurs? We're gonna select a change for your energy pyramid model, then examine changes and record your results in your research assistant notebook. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and scroll down. In my research assistant notebook, I'm on page two. Here we're working on step four and we are gonna be recording our results in this population chart to track the changes that we observe. Okay, here we know if it's a plus, that means the population increased. If it's a minus, it decreased and zero is gonna represent no change. So let's go ahead and see what happens. So this, it says base pyramid. That's the original pyramid that we built. That's the pyramid based on, I guess you could say right at this moment um, without any significant biotic or abiotic changes to the system. Now I'm gonna go ahead and make an, a biotic change. And this change is that wolves have been introduced into this area. What would happen if humans uh, introduce wolves into this area, how would that impact the things that live there? Okay, 
So let's go ahead and select it and see what happens. Now I can always go back and compare base pyramid, wolves added, base pyramid, wolves added. Okay, so when we've added wolves and I look over here at population chart, I can see it says Cooper's hawk, it's unclear if there would be an impact on them. Cougar population would likely go down. So in my research assistant notebook over here, I'm gonna go ahead and mark. So we have the biotic change, wolves added. Cooper's hawk's unclear, so I'm gonna add a zero. Cougar, I'm gonna put a negative because it, uh, the population is likely to decrease. All right, let's see, wolves of course goes up because we've introduced wolves. And black bear, it says it's unclear if wolves would have an, uh, an impact on black bears. So let's go ahead and put unclear. I'm gonna put a circle or a zero or an O, <laughs> but I'm gonna go ahead and be marking. Now, uh, I want you to go ahead and get started on your own filling in this chart. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask those. Um, but let's go ahead and be working and I will be working on my end as well.
Okay, so we hopefully we're working hard on getting this uh, research assistant notebook filled out. And as you looked at the abiotic and biotic changes, you probably noticed some pretty interesting things. Um, I did as well. All right, so if you need more time, you can pause my video. Uh, I'm ready, so I'm gonna go ahead and keep moving along. So if you're ready, you can join me. Um, now, I filled out my research assistant notebook and I noticed that uh, when we added wolves, we had some impacts to some organisms, but many were not impacted in any way, or it was unclear. Um, however, you know, we did notice that the wolves, of course, their food source, animals like Rocky Mountain mule deer, we noticed a decline in population. Um, we really didn't see very many increases, um, except we did notice that, for example, pine grass, I guess, if there's fewer Rocky Mountain elk, then there would be uh, less, they would not be eating pine grass, so we would see an increase possibly in pine grass, something like that. But pretty limited impacts overall. Now, abiotic change like wildfire, wildfire certainly had more negative impacts. So we saw more populations decline. We noticed a handful of populations that would possibly do better in a situation after wildfire has occurred. Okay, so changes to the environment would, uh, would mean Rocky Mountain elk and Rocky Mountain deer. It looks like their population might increase if there was a wildfire, but certainly many would probably decrease, it looks like. All right, now the most shocking, I, th I thought was the most shocking change would be extreme drought. And this is where it gets really interesting. Extreme drought obviously would negatively impact pretty much all living things in this ecosystem. Okay, they all rely on water. It's an important part of the system. Now, you maybe noticed one very curious thing, mountain pine beetles. The only population that would potentially benefit, so their population would increase in a situation of drought, okay? And we've been learning more about pine beetles and why dr uh, drought benefits them. So, uh, that was in some of our earlier investigations, but it's really interesting to think about how because of drought, it weakens the trees, the trees are more susceptible to pine beetle infestation, so populations would likely increase. Okay, let's go ahead and select next. We're going to go on to step five. Now here we have some questions for us to reflect. I'm going to go ahead and read it out loud and we can work on it together. It says reflect. How might these different types of changes impact the populations of organisms in this montane ecosystem. Work with your partner to answer these reflection questions, then click Submit. Question one, which change had the largest effect on this ecosystem and why? Okay, extreme drought had the largest effect on the ecosystem because a lack of water affects all the organisms. Wildfire had the largest effect on the ecosystem uh, because it affected some organisms' populations a lot. Introducing wolves had the largest effect on this ecosystem because some organisms' populations went up and some went down. It is impossible to know which one affected the ecosystem more because all changes had different effects. Oh, that's a really interesting question. So the largest effect. I'm gonna go ahead and guess extreme drought had the largest effect because it had impacted the greatest number of organisms. How I'm gonna interpret that question. Now, which change had the smallest effect on this ecosystem and why? Extreme drought had the smallest effect because most organisms don't drink water. Wildfire had the smallest effect on this ecosystem because many animals can escape by leaving the area. Introducing wolves had the smallest effect on the ecosystem because most organism populations went unchanged. It is impossible to know. I'm gonna say introducing wolves had the smallest effect. And again, I'm not thinking that in terms of the population size of the impacted organisms. I'm just thinking based on the number of different organisms. Okay, which type of change had the greatest effect on organisms' populations? Abiotic changes had the greatest effect because natural disturb disturbances and natural hazards affect all the organisms in a population. Biotic changes had the greatest effect because changes to one organism can create ripples throughout the ecosystem. 
Where both biotic and abiotic were disruptive, there was not a pattern of one type being more disruptive than the other. I'm gonna say the abiotic. So that's the wildfire example and extreme drought because it impacted the, uh, the greatest diversity of organisms. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and select submit. We can look here at what Isabel thinks and what Dr. Mitch says. So let's just read Dr. Mitch, Dr. Mitch's thoughts. Uh, Dr. Mitch says, extreme drought is one of the only changes that affects nearly everyone in an ecosystem. Some organisms drink water directly and will be affected first when a drought happens. However, all organisms rely on plants to transform sunlight, water, and nutrients into energy or food that can be consumed. So if there are less plants, there are less the animals that eat the plants, which means less of the animals that eat those animals and so on. So we can see that the extreme drought has a major effect, right? It affects the producers, which are that base in the energy pyramid. And so without that energy, it will greatly impact consumers at all levels. Which change had the smallest effect? Okay, so Dr. Mitch says, of these three changes, wildfire actually has the smallest effect on the ecosystem as a whole because many organisms are able to escape damage by fleeing the area or digging down into the ground. While many plants are lost, new plants are often quick to appear replacing what was burned. Okay, so I like Dr. Mitch's reasoning there. Um, and basically one of the things he's pointing out is that the change is for a limited period of time and that uh, versus the wolves, which is an ongoing impact um, wildfire has an immediate impact, but then over time, the ecosystem will recover. All right, the last question. Dr. Mitch says, often biotic and abiotic changes are interconnected. Biotic changes can trigger abiotic changes and abiotic changes can trigger biotic changes. Because of this, it's hard to say that one type of change has a larger impact than the other. They both can have good and bad, large and small effects. Okay, so you can see it's a very nuanced and, and uh, complex system, right? So complex results are hard to interpret. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and select next. I'm gonna say continue. We're just going to take a look at where we're gonna be starting tomorrow. Um, let's go ahead and watch this video together. And here we're gonna be learning about something called limiting factors, how these factors can affect populations of organisms. So let's just quickly see. Limiting factors are conditions that can limit the overall health and abundance of a population. They can be biotic or abiotic. So let's go ahead and, and learn about what are limiting factors. You put your model to the test with biotic and abiotic changes. You probably noticed a lot of potential changes that affected many species at different levels. Just like the spreading ripple in a river, the results of a biotic or abiotic change in an ecosystem is called a ripple effect or trophic cascade. We started this investigation asking how changes in an ecosystem may affect populations. Now, if you've seen some of those effects in your model, did you notice that none of the changes affected all the species? We're looking at the effects of changes on populations. I wonder, are there any changes that affect all populations? Let's see what Dr. Mitch has to say. It's hard to say something affects everyone in an ecosystem. There are always exceptions, but scientists generally agree that light, water, and temperature affect every species. Why is that? Sufficient water and the right temperature range are what we call limiting factors. They're things that every species needs to survive. Makes sense. Every plant and every animal needs light as well as the water and temperature ranges that are right for them. For them, that's a key point. Those ideal temperature, light, and precipitation ranges are different for each species in the Uintas. So a good temperature range for an owl might not be ideal for a hawk? Right, or annual rainfall that's okay for a juniper tree might not be enough for a lodgepole pine. If it gets warmer or if the annual rainfall changes, some species will still be in their comfort range, but others won't. Precipitation and temperature are limiting factors for everyone, including us. So let's look at what happens when those factors change in the Uentas. Pick a change from the menu, 
examine its effect on lodgepole pine, pica, sapsuckers, and Douglas firs. Why would some of these populations shrink while others stay the same or grow? Test your thinking in the challenge questions. All right, excellent. So that was, of course, very interesting to hear from Dr. Mitch again. Let's go ahead and select next. And it says here, what are limiting factors? Each organism has factors that limit their population. We call these limiting factors. Temperature and precipitation are limiting factors that affect all organisms, although some are more sensitive to changes than others. Let's go ahead and take a look at our research assistant notebook. I'm gonna scroll down. And here it says on uh, page, what page are we on? Three, <laughs> page three at the top, step six, it says define limiting factors. Okay, so let's, again, let's go ahead and talk about what are limiting factors. They're factors that limit a population. Um, some organisms may be more sensitive to these factors than others. Okay, so in your own words, go ahead and write down what, how you define limiting factors. Okay, all right, so here on step seven uh, of Analyze, we have read how each of these four organisms is affected by precipitation and temperature, record your notes in your research assistant notebook, and then click next. All right, so here we have Douglas fir, lodgepole pine, red-naped sapsucker, and down here we have cute little pica. I like pikas a lot. <laughs> okay, so as we're looking at each of these organisms, it lists two limiting factors. Okay, we have precipitation and temperature. And it tells us um, about that particular organism, how it responds to changes with that factor. Okay, so let's just read, let's actually read pika since I think pikas are cute, I like them. Um, precipitation. So pikas live in dry environments. That's something they're used to, right? They live in dry environments. They depend on their habitat, having enough precipitation to sustain the grasses that they eat and dry enough to be able to dry the grass and store it for winter. Interesting. So there's two preferences there. On the one hand, they need enough water that there's lots of plants for the pika to consume. But it's important that there's some dry season where the pike is able to collect dried grass and store it for the winter, okay? Now temperature, pikas are very, very sensitive to temperature, it says, because they're not able to regulate their body heat the way other organisms do. They cannot get too hot and they cannot be too cold. So they're gonna seek shade in rocky areas during the summer. They're going to build uh, homes where it's very insulated in the snow in the winter. Okay, so they have some behaviors that help them survive different temperatures, um, but they cannot tolerate too, it sounds like, too extreme temperatures. All right, so let's just look at our research assistant notebook. So what are we doing here? Uh, it says read each of the four organisms and we're gonna record our notes in this chart below. Okay. Now let's go ahead and I'm just gonna be looking at this next part, okay? Because what I think will make the most sense is that we kind of look at the next part and then during study hall time, you can continue to work here on this step. So let's see what happens. It says part two, population impact of abiotic changes. What happens to Douglas fir when there's decreased winter precipitation? So let's go ahead and select decreased winter precipitation. Now I can see here, Douglas fir seems like 
it's not going to see a huge decline or a huge increase in terms of its population. Okay, so there's very little potential impact of decreased winter precipitation. Let's look at the next one, increased, okay? So increased winter precipitation means that there's more winter snow. Now an increase, it says, looks like it will have a negative impact on the Douglas fir. And we are reasoning that to be true because if I go back to here and we look at precipitation, it says that Douglas firs are well adapted to places with lots of snow. However, there is a limit of the amount of water they prefer, okay? Douglas firs uh, can tolerate fairly dry or moist, but do not do well in very wet environments, okay? So lots and lots of winter snow that would cause lots and lots of soggy soil as it gets warmer could be problematic. All right, so I think we're gonna go ahead and uh, wrap up here today. Um, what I would like you to do in the next 10, 15 minutes, is just go ahead and work on page three, taking your notes here and getting that filled out. And then see if you can uh, make it through filling out this section here. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at 11 a.m. for our special guest. Uh, I know that a few of you are tuning in and we just, we're so happy to have you here in class. And uh, we really hope to see you back at 11 a.m. because this speaker, he is so cool, really. His name is Dr. Tim Graham. He lives in Southern Utah. He studies uh, living things in the desert and he specifically studies potholes. And so we're gonna learn about that. And he of course thinks a lot about how changes in the ecosystem will impact different living things that he studies. So we're gonna sort of ask him questions about that. All right, well, thank you again for joining us today. We're so happy that you are here and we are looking forward to class tomorrow and finishing up this investigation. So please continue to work on page three of your research assistant notebook and we will pick up tomorrow where we left off. All right, see you soon.
Hi, Tim. Hey, uh, I just wanted to say hi, and we're expected to start right at 11, so I can see you're ready to go. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and put this slide back on, and then at 11, we'll go ahead and start our conversation. Okay, um, just one sec. Can you see okay with the... I'm using the webcam. Yeah, I can. And I thought it would be easiest to have it sit here on the laptop while I'm talking and then I can show what I'm talking about some. Okay, no, I think we're good. So at 11, okay. we'll start, okay? Okay.
All right, welcome to our Q&A with Dr. Tim Graham. We are so excited to have him here and uh, we're so excited to be having this conversation. Um, he has been doing amazing, truly amazing research in the desert and uh, he is joining us live from the desert, which is so cool. <laughs> So let's go ahead and test your audio again, Tim. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you. And it, it looks oh, very, very sunny where you are. <laughs> yes, it is very sunny. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's gonna be a hot weekend for you, right? Yes, it's supposed to be quite warm down here. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, uh, Tim, it would be so great. Maybe you could just start by telling us a little bit about uh, who you are and a little about your your research. Well, um, so I grew up in New Mexico, so I'm uh, consider myself a true desert rat. Um, I uh, actually have a bachelor's degree in marine ecology, though. So I studied invertebrates in the ocean for a while and then came back to the desert got my PhD studying grasshoppers in the Grand Canyon and was working for the National Park Service here in Moab and um, doing some field trips for some organizations, educational organizations, and um, developed a program uh, to talk about pothole ecology and actually did some work with the National Park Service on potholes. And I've been um, doing that for a long, long time now. Uh, <laughs> I think they're pretty fascinating. Well, awesome. Well, so we are sharing this, of course, we're on the museum's website, but also on Facebook Live. And uh, I know we're going to have people who are tuning in and listening. And the first question I'm sure will be, what what the heck are potholes? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so actually I have a, I have a give, and I was if I could share it, but then I forgot to do that. Um, but it's me laying in the middle of a road, looking at a road pothole. This is most people think of all my study pothole ecology, but that's not what the potholes look like. I'm going to stand up. Now. So there's a big pothole. This one is about 10 meters deep and it's one of the deeper ones in this area. But looking out, you can see all of these little depressions in the rock are potholes. And we just, they're um, basins that have eroded in the rock and they catch water and hold it for, for some of them, a few minutes, um, some for weeks. Um, I've seen some go over a year without drying out during wetter times. Um, in this case, most of these, if you look around, you'll see that that they all have a crack that runs through them. And that's because this area was heavily faulted. And then those faults, those cracks in the rock eroded away and formed the potholes. Oh, I see. Yeah, actually, and that's a, that's a great view. We can really see there Good. what you're describing. Um, and it sort of looks like you're looking at craters on the surface of the moon or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that was so cool. Now, I'm very curious. I feel like this is very like Nat Geo or something, um, but maybe we can describe your setup of like, how are we even talking to you in the middle of the desert right now? <laughs> so <laughs> I have my laptop in my hand. Um, I have a webcam um, <clears throat> that I borrowed from the Grand County Public Library where I work part time. And I have a hotspot that I borrowed from the Grand County Public Library. Cool. Um, and so I'm out here um, able to talk to you live um, with the benefit of some amazing technology. <laughs> and it looks fairly remote. So, yeah. um, well, of course, we want to hear about the amazing things that live in the in the potholes, which I think will be a surprise to many, probably, that are not familiar with it. Yeah. So um, we have, I'm going to sit back down because then I can operate the mouse I have whoa. <laughs> I have some uh, um, some short videos to show you a couple of the critters um, but I'll talk about them first just in general 
Um, so when I talk, when I study potholes, I'm not studying so much the, the dry pool as the aquatic ecosystem that um, is created when it rains and they, and they hold water. So I'm interested in the aquatic animals that live in these pools. But as you could see, when I showed you what the potholes look like, they're quite dry right now. Um, we haven't had much rain in the last month, maybe six weeks. Um, and so there are all of these animals that live in water, but how do they survive that dry period? And that's part of the interesting part of this whole thing. Um, so uh, when a pothole, when it rains, a pothole fills up and it immediately starts to dry out again. And so the animals that are going to occupy that pool have a limited amount of time, sometimes a very short amount of time, um, to um, come back into the pothole, either disperse to the pool or become active because they're already in the, in the pothole. And then um, they have to get their life cycle completed and get to a point where they can withstand that dry period again. And that happens, um, like I say, um, very quickly. And so these, these animals are adapted to having um, short life cycles. And there are, basically there are three strategies that these animals use to survive in that dry period. Um, the first one is escape. So they don't live in the pothole all the time. They're somewhere else in um, a different aquatic ecosystem, a stream. Um, we have a big marshland nearby. The Colorado River is, is not very far away. And so they will be um, living in those areas. We get a big rain and that signifies that, that um, there will be more aquatic habitat for them to occupy. And so they'll disperse from those more permanent um, bodies of water up to the potholes. And the advantage for them to do that is that they can lay eggs in there and their young have um, a small pool with fewer predators and it turns out lots of prey. Um, and so they can get their genes passed on to the next generation um, more effectively. The disadvantage, of course, is that if their life cycle takes more time than the pool stays wet, then that generation of of eggs and offspring die and they don't get a new generation of, of their genes. So um, the animals that do that are, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, the insects, most of the insects, things like aquatic beetles, um, water boatmen, back swimmers. Um, a lot of the things that you see in a pond or uh, in a pool in, the, in a creek or something like that and they fly up to the pools and they adults have wings but the immature forms do not so beetles lay eggs and they hatch into a larva that crawls around on the bottom and then it pupates like a, a butterfly goes into its chrysalis a beetle larva goes into its pupil case and then when it comes out it looks like a beetle and then it has wings, but until it gets out of that pupil case as an adult, it doesn't have wings. So if the pool dries out before it can pupate, then it will die. Oh. And um, things like back swimmers, um, it's the same story. They have, adults have wings, the immature forms do not. Um, another escaper group are the amphibians. And um, we have a couple of species of toads that will come up to the potholes um, to breed when it rains. And they're really interesting because it can rain a lot through the year, but they typically come to the pools in response to the very first big rain in late spring or uh, early to mid summer. And then you never see them again. You'll see them for one night. The adults come up to the pools, they mate, they lay eggs. And then the adults are actually living off of the, the rock fin, this big structure that I was showing you, on the sides of that are places where the cracks, those faults that I was showing you, have eroded away quite a bit. And so they're down and they live in the sand down there 
Um, they come out at night and they feed on the insects and then they go back down into the sand during the day. And so they're actually, the adults are only at the potholes for one night. But then you have tadpoles that hatch out of the eggs and they feed on algae. They breathe with gills. They don't have any limbs. And so they're stuck in that water until they can grow enough to metamorphose into little toadlets. And then they come out and they'll hang around for a couple of days, maybe get a little bit wetter. And then they're back down into the sand between the fins as well. Um, the second strategy is not very common. I call it the Tupperware strategy because the animal seals up inside and keeps itself wet. So it's like putting something in a Tupperware box and mm -hmm. it keeps it moist. And that's a good strategy because they can become active immediately. Their, their metabolic machinery, all of their uh, biomass is, is wet and ready to metabolize when it gets wet again. But it's tough to really seal up and be um, dormant that way, especially when the temperatures are really high. Um, and so that strategy doesn't last for very long, maybe a year or so at the most. Um, mm -hmm. But fortunately, it rains more frequently than once every other year or something. So most of the time it works okay. Yeah. And we'll talk about another organism that uses the Tupperware strategy at the end. Um, and then one of the more most interesting groups, I think, um, are the, the animals that use cryptobiosis. And cryptobiosis, if you break that word down, crypto means hidden, biosis means life. And so these animals have a stage where they are so dormant that we can't measure their metabolic activity. And biologists typically measure either heat production from the chemical reactions of metabolism or carbon dioxide production from breathing out that carbon dioxide like we do or oxygen consumption and we breathe in oxygen and use it. And we can't measure that. It's so little that we can't measure it. But if you put them in the right conditions, you add water, then those critters come to life. And I have some uh, short video clips to show you in just a minute. Um, so those, those organisms are in the pool all the time. And for most of them, the stage that is dormant or that can survive that desiccation, that drying is the egg stage. So when the pool fills up with water, the um, eggs hatch, and then those animals have to mature. They have to grow to the point where they can mate and form new eggs and get those eggs into the sediment if they're gonna have their genes passed on to the next generation. And so um, frequently um, you'll get some rain, but not enough, the eggs will hatch, but before they are mature enough to, uh, to lay eggs, then the pool dries up and they die. And so you lose that generation. And people ask me all the time, well, how do they know whether, you know, is there enough water for me to hatch or not? And that, really isn't the question that they're asking, but, um, but they do um, have strategies for that. So um, most people have heard the cliche, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And that just means, you know, spread things out so that all of your valuables or all of your um, belongings aren't in one place. And yet these guys are stuck sort of in one basket. They're in one pothole and they can't move things around. Well, Mark Twain had a different take on that. And he says, he said, put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket. And so that's what these animals do. They watch that basket and they do that by making eggs that respond to different conditions before they hatch. So for the most part, um, the eggs have to dry out first before they'll hatch and then they get wet and they hatch. But um, some of them will hatch the first time they get wet, but some of them need to be wet twice or three times. Um, there was a, a scientist in South Africa who took some 
of these critters. Um, and I just realized I haven't introduced you to their names, but um, these are crustaceans. So they're related to crabs and lobster. Um, and we call them shrimp, but they aren't true shrimp. But we have fairy shrimp and tadpole shrimp and clam shrimp. And those are some of the, the big uh, animals that you see in the pools. And I have some videos of fairy shrimp and tadpole shrimp I'll show you in just a minute. But so this guy took fairy shrimp, put an individual female in each beaker, and then she laid eggs. He collected those eggs, dried them out, and got them wet. And some of them hatched and some, some of them didn't. So he took the eggs that didn't hatch, dried them out, put them in water. Some of them hatched, some of them didn't. He did that 16 times and he still had eggs that hadn't hatched. So they watched that basket by varying what under what conditions do those eggs hatch. And the chances are that some one of those rains in 16 rains, if, if that's what it takes to hatch, at least one of those will be enough rain that the fairy shrimp that hatch can pull off a whole generation and lay eggs again. So um, that's, I think it's an amazing um, story. It's an amazing adaptation that they have uh, that allows them to live in these very um, unpredictable pools. And yeah, that's something- I mean, yeah, go, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I mean, truly so amazing. And also you've shared so much information there to unpack. I know, I'm sure we're gonna have some, some curious uh, listeners. Um, I just wanna remind them that on Facebook, you can submit a question. If you have a question for Tim, we can take those. Um, one, one question we realized uh, right away, we didn't exactly say where you were. Um, so you, are you in Moab right now or outside of Moab? Um, I'm just outside of Moab. Um, over here, let's see if I can find it, is, um, maybe I'm not high enough, but anyway, there's, there's kind of a valley out there. I can't really uh -huh. see it on my little screen, but um, that is the southern part of the Moab Valley. So I'm just outside of Moab, um, the LaSalle Mountains are over here. They're a, a small isolated range that um, have some of the highest peaks in Utah. And I'm actually um, on part of the famous Sand Flats Recreation Area Slick Rock Bike Trail area. Cool. And uh, you might actually uh, hear a few motors in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah. No, that was great. I think reference just because we didn't exactly say where you were. Yeah. Um, well, in so much of the information you just shared, you know, so much of it connected to what our students have been learning in some of our research quest classes this week. And I just wanted to make some of those connections. Um, you, of course, you were just talking about some of the abiotic factors that impact um, organisms and, and their population size. And uh, we've been talking about that in class. And then also today in class, we were talking about limiting factors um, and how some of these you know, changes such as like extreme drought or wildfire or um, you know, how that might impact populations over time. And so we've just started talking about limiting factors and temperature um, and how some organisms might be more sensitive to certain temperatures than others, for example. And so it kind of relates to some of the things you've been sharing. Yes, exactly. There are um, uh, interesting aspects to that that, that um, relate to the pools um, because uh, like fairy shrimp, the fairy shrimp species that live here um, can be ready to lay their eggs in about four days in the summertime, four to five days. But the tadpole shrimp, it takes about two weeks. And so the tadpole shrimp aren't found in the smallest pools that fairy shrimp are found in. And then a little while later, we'll look at some really little pools that um, last maybe a few hours. And we'll talk about some organisms that live in there and, and I'll show you some of those too. So um, we have this gradation of, there's sort of a physical lower limit to what species can, what size pothole a species can live in. If it's 
if it's a smaller pothole, then they can't pull off their, their um, life cycle. And then often the upper limit is biological because a predator can live in a bigger pothole and that predator may limit the ability of the organism to, to carry out its whole life cycle before it's eaten by the predator. And so you don't find them as often in larger potholes. Um, so yeah, there, there are both biotic and abiotic controls over those populations. Wonderful. Well, we got we got a question. I'm sure you get this question quite a bit um, about how long can some of these, you know, so like the fairy shrimp, for example, um, how long can they be dry in the pothole before I guess they're not <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. viable? So um, I don't know if anyone has ever held fairy shrimp eggs or tadpole shrimp eggs so long that they won't hatch. Um, we have documented cases of eggs on a shelf in a lab someplace for over 50 years and they will still hatch. Um, I've kept them for over 20 years and still gotten some to hatch. So, um, and that brings me to sort of a broader uh, point of that, that aspect of their life. Cryptobiosis is a, it's a really incredible process and results in such a stable state that um, conditions that animals would never have been exposed to, so they couldn't have evolved in response to those conditions, they can still withstand them. So these eggs have been taken out into outer space. They've been taken out of the space capsule into the full ionizing radiation of the sun the vacuum of space, brought back into the capsule, brought back to Earth, put in water, and they hatch. So um, it's really amazing how, um, how stable and how resistant they are to environmental uh, conditions. And so sitting in a pothole, even when the temperature gets up to um, say maybe 60 or 70 degrees Celsius, 150, 160 degrees Fahrenheit, um, or really cold down to um, below zero Fahrenheit, below 20 degrees, negative 20 degrees Celsius, down in that range, and they can withstand that just fine. As an adult, they can't do that, but as an egg, they can withstand those conditions, and so they can live in very harsh environments and are active when that harshness is ameliorated like by rainfall. And one other important aspect of this is that scientists have studied the process of how they get to be this dormant. How do they stabilize all of the molecules that make us up? You know, we have proteins and fats and carbohydrates in our, in our bodies, DNA and RNA, all of those things that are pretty sensitive to environmental conditions. And somehow in that egg, that stuff is stabilized and revitalized. And it turns out that there's a sugar called trehalose that um, helps to kind of lock in the structure of the, of the biological materials. And then as they dry out, then they're making this tree halos and it, and it holds things in place. And then when it gets wet, then that tree halos is pulled out, water is substituted back in and the organism can come back to life. And so we've now been able to take that process and apply it to things that we need. Like we can dry proteins that are antibiotics to preserve, you know, to protect us from disease or blood, we can dry that up and keep it stabilized. And then we don't have to keep it in a refrigerator or a freezer, we can move it as a dry powder. And then when we need it, we add water and it comes back to its biological, biologically active form. So, um, you know, people look at fairy shrimp and tadpole shrimp and they go, well, well they're kind of weird, but what good are they? Well, um, Sometimes 
other animals have evolved processes that that we can actually take advantage of and we can learn how to do something by studying some uh, relatively um, inconspicuous organisms. Um, well, I think, I think you touched on this a little bit. We did get a question on Facebook from Curtis, who was wondering, um, do these potholes have multiple apex species that are competing or do each species have separate pools? It's kind of an interesting question. Um, yeah, so um, most of these pools have a community of organisms. So fairy shrimp, there are uh, two to three species of fairy shrimp in the potholes that live here. Um, a couple of species of clam shrimp. Um, there's only one species of tadpole shrimp. And in general, so if you look at, at the different size classes that I was talking about, where you get an organism that a predator can eliminate it from a larger pool. So we have pools that tadpole shrimp don't survive in and the fairy shrimp do quite well. And there are some other um, organisms in there. There's a, a little fly that the larvae live in those pools more. Um, and then that middle-sized pothole is where the tadpole shrimp is the top predator. And then if it lasts a lot longer, then you get aquatic insects that are more efficient predators. And they will tend to keep the populations of the fairy shrimp and tadpole shrimp lower and if the water stays long enough, then their populations will build up and they'll eat everything. You can come back after two or three months if the water has stayed in there that long and you'll have just those insects in there and no fairy shrimp or tadpole shrimp. Excellent. Um, well, uh, when we asked to interview you today and have this Q&A, you had suggested being out in the field, and I just wanted to make sure we had time. Was there anything specific you wanted to share with us since you're actually in the field right now? Yeah. Um, can I share my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let me okay. check my settings. You should be able to. There you go. Yep. You should be able to share. Okay. Your so I'm going to start with this one. So these are fairy shrimp. And they are, where did I put this? They're swimming around. They're not very big right now, but um, this they're swimming around in this little white jar lid. And um, I hatched these from sediment that I collected a couple years ago. Um, and they grow pretty slowly in an aquarium, much more slowly than they do in the potholes, but um, they've been, they're about a week old right now. Okay, so now I'm gonna go to a different, so this is a tadpole shrimp and it's in the same size uh, lid, but tadpole shrimp, um, fairy shrimp can get to be about three centimeters long, um, one species and the other species about two centimeters long. Tadpole shrimp can be about 10 centimeters long. Hey, Tim, so, um, I'm not able to see that one, but if you just go to, there uh, should be a button that says new share, and then you can share this new. Oh, I see. I'm not, uh, I, I'm impressed that you're even sharing your screen, to be honest. So you, I think your Zoom skills are pretty decent. Okay, so but let's see. Share is always tricky. Let me try sharing it again. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and share it again and then just select the new image. Yeah, okay, so this is, this is actually a different image, but um, uh, maybe, no, it doesn't. Oh, it doesn't seem to be playing. It's not playing. Yeah, it's not playing. I see that. It is playing, but it's playing. I mean, I can see the, the slider move, but well, I was trying to use to have all of them loaded so that, which meant I had to use different, um, different mechanisms, but maybe. Hey, no worries. No worries. We know this is tricky, so. <laughs> Let me see if I can get that one because it's a better picture of the 
of the um, tadpole shrimp. Okay, can you see that one? Uh, go ahead and try sharing your screen again and we'll okay. see. Okay. Yeah. The... Should be the little green button. Yeah, I have to, I have to give, it's not showing me so the. Sometimes the tools move around. Yeah, it's not showing me the, the Zoom screen at all right now. So I have to get. Okay, share. There we go. Awesome. Yep. So, oh, we see it. Yeah. We got. This, we have a question here about the difference between fairy shrimp and brine shrimp. Okay. So Which brine shrimp are um, found in saline lakes, hyper saline lakes, very um, salty bodies of water, and um, fairy shrimp are brine shrimp are a kind of fairy shrimp, but um, there are lots of fairy shrimp that are, don't live in salty water. And basically all of these uh, tadpole shrimp, clam shrimp, and fairy shrimp are called branchiopods. B-R-A-N-C-H means gill and P-O-D means foot. So they breathe through their feet. And they used to be very, very common in all aquatic systems, marine and freshwater. Um, but they're big and they're kind of slow. And so they're easy prey. And so as insects evolved, and especially as fish evolved, then those efficient predators eliminated them from more permanent bodies of water. So now they're limited to places where those organisms can't live or at least can't build up big populations. So temporary pools like my potholes, um, saline lakes like the Great Salt Lake, and high elevation or high latitude um, bodies of water that freeze all the way to the bottom. Um, so those are the places that, that you see them now. Wow, that is that is so interesting. I never realized that, although I, I was aware of the <laughs> brain shrimp and the great salt. Like, I didn't realize that. Um, we have another question here about, uh, it just says, as an entomologist, you study insects here on earth, but we understand, however, that astrobiologists are interested in your work and just kind of understanding why they're interested. Okay, so um, like I mentioned, you know, we've taken those eggs out into outer space. And so there's a possibility that that life using that kind of dormancy mechanism can move through space. And we don't really know if that's feasible. People have hypothesized that, you know, asteroids that have ice on them, uh, comets, that there's water and here are organisms that um, live in water but can be dormant when the conditions are not conducive to being active. And so it's possible that, you know, that life is moving around in space. Um, and that uh, in other places, like now that we know that there is water on Mars, were there organisms that were cryptobiotic and, um, active on Mars, we don't know. But that's, it's a, an interesting avenue. Um, it's not one that I've pursued because I like being on terra firma myself. But, uh, and there <laughs> are plenty of fascinating things for me to look at down here. Uh, oh but some God. people are, are looking at that aspect. It's a good question. Yeah, that is interesting. Okay, that's helpful to sort of understand that big picture. Um, well, we still have a, maybe just a few more minutes. Was there anything else you wanted to share with us while we're out here in the field? Yes. I want to show you my my special um, organism. Okay, just just a sec. <laughs> Stop it. No problem. I feel like this is sort of an 
an awesome experiment that is going to open up doors to new ways of teaching out in the field <laughs> with broad audiences. So yeah, I, mean, I hope so. This is just a cool trial. So uh -oh, I'm not seeing the file on my options for sharing. Huh. Where'd it go? Huh. Oh, let's look at files. Hmm. Well, let me close this one. Maybe then it will substitute the other one. Well, maybe you can uh, you could describe too what you were hoping to share or looking for. Yeah. So, um, oh, maybe let me try this. Maybe if this one is running, it will be. Huh. It's just not there. Well, so um, there are little bitty potholes that um, I mentioned some that, that only um, may hold water for a few hours. Um, I've filled them up sometimes with uh, half a liter of water. I'm trying to get back to, to where I can see you guys anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, and these little pools, um, let's see, I can, I can walk down and show you one, um, but I had a, a video with, with the um, um, critters becoming active. So we'll walk down this little bit and I'll show you the size of these pools compared to this great big one over here. Yeah, that one's huge. <laughs> then we have Where is it? Where is it? <laughs> Where I think I'm pointing this thing isn't necessarily pointing there. Okay, there. So you can see that kind of line of dirt and a little bit of black. My feet are straddling it. Mm -hmm. That's a pothole. Here's another one with no sediment in it at all. But these still have, they're still ecosystems. And they, um, the black kind of bathtub ring is a community of algae, and cyanobacteria, and other bacteria. And then when there's sediment in there, they also get some animals, multicellular animals. Some of them are, are quite tiny. Um, some of you may have heard of tardigrades, water bears and also rotifers and nematodes. And those all use the cryptobiosis strategy to survive in those little potholes. But there's another um, animal, it's a mite. So it's related to, um, to um, spiders and uh, ticks and so on. And it's, um, ah, <laughs> I thought I'd try to get it started again, but now it's, there we go. Um, so this mite um, lives in these little potholes and it uses the Tupperware strategy. So remember I told you their Tupperware is a good short-term strategy. Um, it seals up the water inside, but then, um, it's not as effective for long term. And so these mites, we've had them uh, last about a year, but most of the time it's six months, eight months, and, and everything that you had in a jar is dead. Um, but these mites are unique for a, a number of reasons. Um, and part of it is that they're in a group that doesn't normally live in water, isn't normally active in water. And um, when I first found these, in the potholes here, 
I sent them off to a mite guy and um, he wrote back and said, well, these are um, most closely related to a mite that's found in rock pools in South Africa. And, you know, those of you that know your geography, we're a long way from South Africa right here for a little mite that is about the size of, if you have a mechanical pencil with a half a millimeter diameter lead, they're about that big around. And they live in these little pools. And they um, become active just within seconds. And so the video I was trying to show was starting with a dry pothole and adding water. And you can see within 30 seconds, there are about 10 mites crawling around just in the little screen there. Um, and just amazing and in fact we that's i think our last question we we had someone ask about the ge geographic distribution and sort of where these things are found around the world so i feel like you're kind of touching on that now uh-huh yes um ephemeral pools um some are in rock like this there are some that are in um sediment often they'll get a clay bottom that's impermeable to water um but they're um, in general, we talk about ephemeral pools. Ephemeral means that they don't last very long. Um, I like the rock pools because I like this part of the world with lots of rock. Um, but I worked in California for a few years and the Central Valley of California has vernal pools. Vernal means spring. And in the springtime, they get flowers in the pool. But in the wintertime, they dry or they are filled with water and they have tadpole shrimp and fairy shrimp and clam shrimp in them. In California, has such a an isolated biology compared to the rest of North America. There are, um, I think, seven or eight um, species of fairy shrimp and one species of tadpole shrimp that are found only in California. Um, but um, across the globe, we have ephemeral pools pretty much everywhere. Um, so there are pools in Europe, pools in South America, South Africa, Australia, um, and people are studying them all over. But um, this mite is found only on the Colorado Plateau, as far as we know. There's another species, the one in South Africa, and there's a third species that's similar that's found in Georgia. And Georgia has these lumps of granite, and up on top there are little potholes, and that species is there. And the species that's here on the Colorado Plateau, um, I first found in about 1988, and uh, the mite taxonomists have decided to name it after me. So its, it's genus is called Paraquanathrus, and its species name is Grammi. So that's why that I have to talk about it. Awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I can tell we needed more time, uh, clearly, because yeah. all of this is just so fascinating. Um, but so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Really, truly, we appreciate you um, joining us. And uh, we're just sort of wrapping up our last few days of Research Quest Live. And uh, we hope to connect with you again in the future and maybe do it virtually again like this. I yeah, think it worked out yeah. pretty well. So It's a lot uh, more fun to come out here after it rains and, and poke around in the pools yourself. Yeah, I'm sure. We'll do something, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, well, cool. Well, thank you so much, Tim. And sure, thank uh, you. For those that are tuning in, we will have class tomorrow. We're gonna to be speaking with another scientist tomorrow. Um, so we hope to have uh, our audience join us again then. And uh, we'll say bye. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to put on here our last. So we hope to see you tomorrow.